And my name is Dennis Murphy. I'm the president of the Interfaith Center for Peace and, Ju Peace and Justice, ICPJ. We welcome you to the 10th Annual William K. Collins Lecture. Mr. Collins was a benefactor for St. Francis Xavier Church and the ICPJ. And this lecture hall, actually you'll see a little plaque right over there, is named after him and his wife, Rita M. Collins. The lecture is jointly sponsored by ACPJ and the St. Francis Xavier Social Welfare and Justice Committee. Uh, ICPJ is an organization that's been around in Adams County since the mid 80s. Uh, we sponsor a number of uh, major activities uh, in the area, including the annual Heritage Festival in September. Uh, this week, uh, we are in our 31st Peace Camp uh, for uh, first through fifth graders. Uh, we also sponsor the Peacemaker Awards, which you may have seen the picture in the paper last week, one of our own. Alex Hayes was selected as a Peacemaker. Uh, and we also sponsor events like this in order to promote social justice and peace in our area. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dr. Charles Strauss, a member of St. Francis. Charles received his PhD in history from the University of Notre Dame, which is very hard for some of us to say, but anyway, uh, and is now an Associate Professor of History at Mount St. Mary's, as well as Executive Secretary of the American Catholic Historical Association. Charles is well known to many of you as President of St. Francis Xavier School Advisory Board, a board member of ICPJ, and a former member of the Gettysburg Borough Council. Charles's lecture is titled, The Church's Field Hospital, St. John Newman, St. Francis Xavier Parish, and Catholic social teaching. Welcome, Dr. Charles Strath. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you. And also, uh, thank you, Bill Collins. Uh, when I've been asked why I am on the ICPJ board, I always say one reason, Bill Collins. And the reason I accepted this engagement tonight is also Bill Collins. He has been a gentle force on Mount St. Mary's campus for a long time. He's oriented and welcomed uh, so many faculty who are new into what it means to be a scholar teacher at a Catholic school. So I just want to honor Bill Collins. He's not here, he's having cataract surgery tomorrow. So uh, Susan is here, so that is good. <laughs> Uh, so please keep Bill um, in your thoughts. And if you don't like my remarks tonight, maybe uh, you should just thank Bill Collins, uh, too. I'm going to keep these remarks to about 50 minutes and then leave time for conversation. Many of the people that I see in this room appear in the history of St. Francis Xavier Parish. So many of you, maybe even most of you, know experientially more about this place than I do. I have discovered this place over the last 10 years through my children, and then more recently uh, through the archive. But I would I welcome corrections, additions to what I'm about to share. So let's begin. On Sunday, June 20th, 1852, that's 170 years ago today, for those of you like me who have trouble keeping track of days in the summer, the newly appointed Catholic Bishop of Philadelphia came to Gettysburg. Now, to set the scene a little for what was going on in 1852, Millard Fillmore, the 13th President of the United States and a member of the Whig Party, was in his last year in office. Longtime statesman from Kentucky, Henry Clay, known as the Great Compromiser for his involvement in managing how states entered the Union, died in 1852. So sectional conflict between North and South was gearing up, was heating up in America. In March 1852, Henry Wells and William Fargo created Wells Fargo and Company. I always think of Music Man when I say Wells Fargo. And Smith & Wesson was founded as a firearms manufacturer in that year. So it was a time of growing corporations. Corporations were emerging and growing in the mid-19th century. Harriet Beecher Stowe published Uncle Tom's Cabin in book form in 1852. Um, Frederick Douglass delivered his famous speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, in Rochester, New York. 
So I acknowledge that today is Juneteenth, and thinking about Beecher Stowe and Frederick Douglass reminds us of the poignancy of, of this very day. Abolitionists were doubling their efforts to expose the evils of slavery. Empires dominated much of geopolitics, the British Empire and Africa and Latin America and Asia, the United States and Hawaii and Central America. And in Adams County, maybe a little more joyful of a history, the Sachs Covered Bridge was completed in 1852. So it was amidst these regional, national, and geopolitical events that John Newman traveled Tried to figure this out, 130 miles, but it's not like you took the highway, so I'm not exactly sure how many miles it was in 1852 as the crow flies, but he came to St. Francis Xavier Parish in order to dedicate the cornerstone of a new church building still under construction on West High Street. The mostly German and also Irish Catholic community of Gettysburg had outgrown their first church building. Many of you know who have read those really excellent two histories of St. Francis that are digitized on the uh, parish website know that that original church building had been completed in 1831 on South Washington Street. And this brand new bishop warmly welcomed an invitation by the pastor here to consecrate a new church because Catholics had outgrown that original 1831 structure. At the time, and you might be asking, why did the Bishop of Philadelphia come? At the time, uh, Harrisburg Diocese was not exist, did not exist. So Harrisburg was part of Philadelphia, as was Scranton and Wilmington and parts of northern New Jersey. A little bit about this guy, John Newman, to start. He was born in 1811 in Bohemia, or what is today the Czech Republic, and he had only been in the country 16 years when he came here to Gettysburg for the first time. He had also only been a priest for 16 years uh, because he had been ordained shortly upon arriving here, and he was ordained from the Diocese of New York uh, by the founding this is, there are so many connections that are going to come up over the next 50 minutes. The first one here is that the bishop who ordained John Newman was the founding uh, president of Mount St. Mary's University, John Dubois, left Mount St. Mary's and became Bishop of New York. Many of you know that. Um, Newman's first parish work was in Buffalo. In 1842, Newman became the first priest in the United States to claim the orders of the Redemptorist Congregation of Priests and Brothers. Uh, the Redemptorists had been founded in 1732 by Alphonsus Liguori to originally, very specific original charge, to minister to the needy of Naples, Italy. Uh, but then as it, grow, it grew, became a missionary and ministry uh, congregation for the needy. As a Redemptorist, Newman served in parishes in Baltimore and then in Pittsburgh, ultimately rising to general superior or head boss of the American Redemptorist in 1847, a job that he did not seek, but by my reading, did very well. That's normally how that happens. People who don't seek leadership are the best leaders. In 1848, John Newman became an American citizen. And four years later, on his 41st birthday, he was, again reluctantly, consecrated as the fourth bishop of Philadelphia. Now, I'm gonna to return to John Newman's story a little later, but what is important to know now also, and many of you I'm sure do, is that in 1977, Newman became the first American male saint of the Roman Catholic Church. He was known in life as having a strong intellect, a zeal for missionary work, a total commitment to ministering to immigrants, specifically through the construction of Catholic schools, and organizational skills that allow him to manage a religious community of priests and brothers and a rapidly expanding diocese of Catholics. When he was Bishop of Philadelphia, Philadelphia was the largest diocese in America. So I begin with this scene from 170 years ago today because tonight I'm doing something different than I normally would do in a historical lecture. When I'm teaching at Mount St. Mary's or I'm trying to share my research, I stick to the archive and I stick to the historical arguments. But Phil Collins said I didn't have to do that tonight. <laughs> So I think that what I'm about to share is more like a historical meditation. Don't worry, Father Lynch, I'm not a theologian, and I'm not going to try to be a theologian today, but I'm going to attempt to use some of this history to open up some theological questions. And ultimately, I'll come back to that, what I want to do is to find purpose, and maybe even joy, in theology and history, using a lesson from right here. And you know, by right here, I mean that church on the left 
1852-1853 construction on West High Street where John Newman visited. And I'm going to uh, do that in three ways. Let me get to that in a second. Again, I'm not a theologian. I'm a historian of Catholicism, specifically Catholic experience in the United States. That's what I've been studying and trying to do for a good bit of time now. I do know some theology. Uh, my undergrad, I don't know if this joke is going to work or not, but sometimes most colleges don't, don't land either, so we just going to go with it. Um, my undergraduate advisor would say that I know enough theology to get by at a Jesuit cocktail party. So I don't know if that means anything to you, but that's uh, where I am. Um, so I'm going to draw out three things here. Um, now, I had some remarks here for those who are not connected to this place, maybe not a part of St. Francis, maybe not a Catholic, maybe suspicious of faith. I still hope that you would find something usable in tonight, <clears throat> because I think when you look at what the Catholic Church has attempted to accomplish with all of its failures and limitations at times, there's quite a bit of instruction. So before I introduce the three things here, I wanted to share a little bit of what I mean about this. Just these statistics surprised me when I researched them for today. With its 6,200 K-12 schools, the Catholic Church is the largest provider of private education in the country. It is the nation's largest private provider of higher education, with 220 colleges and universities. It's the largest private provider of health care in the country, with one of six Americans getting their health care from Catholic health systems. One in six go to Catholic hospitals. It's the largest private provider of poverty services, with one out of four Americans in poverty receiving services from Catholic charities and or the St. Vincent de Paul Society. It's the largest resettler of refugees, larger than the federal government. U.S.-based Catholic Relief Services, or CRS, a group I know many of you know well, provides crisis relief for 127 million people in 114 countries on five continents every single year. And CRS is just one of the Catholic Church's 160 international relief organizations organized by country and coordinated by a group called Caritas International in Rome. So I'm not offering these as boasts uh, about Catholicism or to make us feel better. We all know well missteps and wrongs, even systemic wrongs and, and well sins of the Catholic Church over time and in our own time. But I do offer them to suggest that the size and scale of Catholic efforts in the area of education and human services just cannot be underestimated. Now, by zooming in to the right here, John Newman and St. Francis Xavier, I hope to revive some purpose and joy that can be lost amidst the bigness and to some, let's be honest, maybe the coldness of some parts of the Catholic Church, especially as it engages or is engaged by media. All right, so let's get back to it now. The talk has three parts. First, a metaphor. For, the finding, for finding purpose and joy that comes from Pope Francis, who's in his ninth year, if you can believe it, as Bishop of Rome and spiritual leader of the Catholic Church. Secondly, a model of purpose and joy from the life story, and I can only share glimpses of that life story tonight of John Newman. And then I'm gonna share some moments in time where purpose and joy can be detected in the history of St. Francis Xavier Catholic School since its founding in 1877. So a metaphor, a model, and a few key moments. Ecclesiology is a churchy kind of word, um, but it may be helpful to grasp at the, uh, the definition here at the start, or one definition. Ecclesiology is the branch of theology that deals with the study of the church. What is the church? What are its functions? Is it visible, invisible, or both? The root of ecclesiology is the Greek word ecclesia, or church. One of the first places to look for understanding Christian ecclesiology is the Nicene Creed, which dates to the year 381. The church is, you all know this, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. In 1974, the Jesuit theologian Avery Dulles offered additional words for models of the church, and he chose five, at least to start. The church's institution, mystical communion, sacrament, herald, and servant. Now, I find all these words to be helpful because they feel concrete. Uh, you might, or I might have trouble defining church, but I know what a servant is, or I can tell you what a herald does, 
or how an institution operates, and I think that's why Avery Dulles wrote that book. In an expanded version of that book, he added a sixth, uh, sixth word, the church's community of disciples. He also analyzed strengths and weaknesses for each word. We all know bad institutions and we know good institutions. We know when a servant is doing something for their own good and when a servant is doing something for the good of others. So he analyzed how both uh, and can be a part of each of these words and ultimately said that integrating all six is a good way to think about Catholic ecclesiology. Now, he's not the only one to come up with words and the Nicene Creed isn't the only place for it, Christ himself prophets, women and men of many faiths, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, have their own sense of church, our own students, sometimes the mouth of children. Uh, my son Charlie, when he was younger, once said that church means quiet. <laughs> now, I think that means he says we say quiet to him a lot in church, so it probably is not the best word for church, but it's one that I remember him saying. In the summer of 2013, Pope Francis offered his own metaphor for church when he sat down for an interview in Rome with the editor of an academic journal published by the Italian Jesuits. It would ultimately appear in the Jesuits' journal in the U.S. called America. And the editor of the journal asked the Pope this, What does the church need most at this historic moment? Do we need reforms? What are your wishes for the church in the coming years? And what kind of church do you dream of? And this is what the Pope responded. And I know it's gonna be hard at the back. All the quotations are also in the handout with some citations if you wanna follow up. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. <clears throat> it is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Pope Francis continued. The ministers of the gospel must be people who can warm the hearts of the people, who walk through the dark night with them, who know how to dialogue and to descend themselves into their people's night, into the darkness, but without getting lost. Instead of being just a church that welcomes and receives by keeping the doors open, let us try also to be a church that finds new roads, that is able to step outside itself and go to those who do not attend Mass, to those who have quit or are indifferent. A field hospital after battle. Bear with me, but maybe just pause for a few seconds to imagine what a field hospital does. What does it look like? Who is doing what? Does it have a smell? What are the sounds? This is what Pope Francis wanted to motivate, I think. He didn't tell me. His desire was to pierce through the busyness of daily life, the political partisanship of it, the ideological battles, the formalities, and the apathy, and to invite people to think about each other's wounds and what we can do to see them and then to heal them. Well, the response to the interview was immediate and impressive. In France, the village de Francois, according to the organization's website, uh, develops and runs innovative shared living spaces which bring together vulnerable people and those who care for them around three axes, living together, economic activity, and integral ecology. And integral ecology is a holistic way of understanding global challenges like related to geopolitics, the economy, the environment, and how that relates to human behaviors and activities and relationships, things that people do in their own lives. The team behind the Village de Francois is comprised of social entrepreneurs, green tech company managers, association leaders, urban and landscape architects, and eco-builders, according to their website. And uh, I just read that the Pope met with this group in March for the, for the most recent time, but he's been in, interacting with this group who seem to have been inspired by his field hospital metaphor. In our own country, Cardinal Blaise Supic of Chicago has picked up Francis's metaphor and speaks frequently about the church's field hospital in his homilies and writings. And in an article in 2017, he said this, and I know it's really faint, but I'll read it and it's on your handout. By calling the church a field hospital, Pope Francis calls us to radically rethink ecclesial life. He is challenging all of us to give priority to the wounded, 
This means placing the needs of others before our own. The field hospital church is the antithesis of the self-referential church. It is a term that triggers the imagination, forcing us to rethink our, our identity, mission, and our life together as disciples of Jesus Christ. Medics are useless if the wounded cannot reach them. Those who have the bandages go to those with the wounds. They do not sit back in their offices waiting for the needy to come to them. The field hospital marshals its institutional resources in order to serve those who need most help now. Now we at St. Francis do not look, need to look far to learn something about field hospitals. We have one in our own West High Street Church in July 1863. I think we all know that St. Francis and many other buildings became hospitals during the Battle of Gettysburg. If we forget, it is written in bronze on the front of the historic church. During the Battle of Gettysburg, this house of God became a hospital for wounded soldiers. Within its hallowed walls, brave men of North and South foes on the field of battle through weeks of pain were nursed with tender and equal care by the Sisters of Charity of Emmitsburg. During the battle and for weeks after, the Catholic Church of St. Francis was a hospital for the wounded, carefully tended to by the pastor, Father McGinley, and the Sisters of Charity, 16 of them who came by carriage from St. Joseph's Emmitsburg. They actually moved from place to place. They were here for a minute, they went to the Lutheran Seminary, they went to the Methodist Church, they went to the public school. So they were working in several locations. And there are many individual stories about what the sisters encountered in a church that was literally turned into a field hospital. I was thinking of adding more to the uh, story by, by talking about them, but I'll just recommend a book to you that I found called A Vast Sea of Misery. Great title. A History and Guide to the Union and Confederate Field Hospitals at Gettysburg, July 1st to November 20th, 1863. And it's by Gregory Coco. Um, it would be something because there are a few pages in there of just stories about St. Francis. But my role is not to enliven that history, despite what the headline said in the paper about this talk. Instead, it's to remind us that St. Francis has a history from 1863 on responding to human pain, both physical and almost, you know, it's very likely spiritual and emotional pain was being dealt with in the field hospital as well. Now, for this reason, because this thing happened in St. Francis in July 1863, the Knights of Columbus, a fraternal order of Catholic men founded in 1882, raised funds to honor the St. Francis Field Hospital reconsecrated as church with the new stone facade for our historic church, a history I know so many of you already know. The consecration of the new facade took place on May 10, 1925, and the Gettysburg Times ran a special page, page five, to honor those events. There are about four or five articles in the paper all about the KFC and St. Francis. Now, you might not know that the Knights of Columbus had been involved in many large, uh, much larger than a new facade, educational projects and relief projects in the first few decades of its founding. First, it provided significant support to victims of the Johnstown flood in 1889 and the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. It led logistics and relief efforts in the Spanish-American War and in World War I. It provided and still provides college scholarships for veterans and insurance programs for immigrants more so previously, but it was in the insurance business. And it endowed the first chair of American history at Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. But in 1922, the Pennsylvania organization of the Knights of Columbus voted, quote, to investigate and report to the next state convention the proposition of presenting to St. Francis Xavier a fitting memorial of the men of the Catholic faith who had given their lives in the cause of the American Union, and also the Sisters of Charity who administered to the wants of uh, the, those who endured, as well as the dying during these terrible three days of fighting. By 1923, they had agreed to assess each council across Pennsylvania a fee or a charge in order to come up with the $25,000 it would take for the project. And on May 10th at 3 p.m., the new facility was officially consecrated in a festive ceremony on West High Street. Although from this newspaper report I found, it looks like many were not able to make the drive to uh, attend because of heavy rains. Um, so the reports from Philadelphia and other cities along the route 
where special caravans were scheduled to leave for Gettysburg with the effect that the rains were so severe that it was deemed advisable to postpone any attempt to make the journey here. But you wouldn't know that from this crowd that's assembled. And probably the best find that I discovered while researching this talk is this clip of silent footage from the May 10th, 1925 dedication. Just wanna cue this up so it's easy to see. And before I turn it on, the special guest that you're gonna see here, um, the Pennsylvania State Deputy of the Knights of Columbus, the Bishop of Harrisburg, the Governor of Maryland, Albert C. Ritchie, and Reverend Peter Gilday, who is a professor of church history, also one of these weird connections. Peter Gilday taught church history at Catholic University of America, and he founded the American Catholic Historical Association and was their first executive secretary treasurer. And in 2018, Mount St. Mary's took over the headquarters of the American Catholic Historical Association, and I became the executive secretary treasurer. So I'm like the fifth person in line with this Peter Gilday uh, who started it here and appears in this video, which is just a strange coincidence I discovered. favorite part of these three children in the back. You're going to see them again in a minute. I wish you could get closer because in the front you can see the Sisters of Mercy right up in the front there. And then these two, these three kids are great to see too. They probably were at the school. <clears throat> it's almost over. I think this close up footage is so crystal clear. It's amazing to me from 1925. That's Governor Ritchie from uh, Maryland. So yeah, it doesn't look to me that there were uh, anybody uh, missing there. <laughs> West High Street looks packed. So bringing this point home about metaphor, Pope Francis teaches that humans are asked to heal each other's wounds and that this is an absurd and impossible project if we don't first find out where those words, wounds are and see them with our own eyes. Point two, model. So we turn back now to John Newman and I've already shared some of his biography. Allow me to fill in a few more details. I practice some of this Czech pronunciation so much today, and as I'm looking at these words, I've lost all of it. So I apologize if there's some Czech speakers in the room, I'm sorry. John Newman was born on March 28, 1811, in Prakatici, Bohemia, and baptized on the same day. That's his childhood home there on the right. And there, if you are having trouble placing the Czech Republic in your mind, you can see on the map, very central Europe and the Kingdom of Bohemia uh, as it appeared at the time that John Newman would have lived there. He went to school in Budweiss. I couldn't resist. It's the original Budweiss. 
but it is in the same connection, the same world as Budweiser beer. Um, he got good grades in school, specifically in theology, but also in the natural sciences. He was a wonderful linguist. He uh, mastered Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, but he also uh, got to speak eight modern languages fluently. While in seminary in the Vice, he was called, he felt called to missionary work, particularly uh, missionary work in the United States. I know we don't tend to think of the United States as mission territory, but it, according to the Catholic Church until the second decade of the 20th century, America was mission territory, canonically determined that way. And in some ways, there's reverse mission going on in the United States today with a number of priests coming from abroad serving in our parishes, but he felt a call to do mission in the United States. It could have been because tens of thousands of German Catholics, and he was um, mostly a German speaker, had emigrated to the United States, and there was an urgent need for German-speaking priests. Now, I know that this room knows that immigrant life in America has never been easy, um, nor uh, it wasn't easy in the 1840s through the 1880s, which was that first wave of European immigration from Eastern Europe and from Germany and Italy and Ireland and Poland and also Mexico. And it, has, it wasn't easy for Chinese immigrants who went on the, to the West Coast or for more recent immigrants from Latin America, Asia, or Africa. It's not an easy thing to be an immigrant. Catholic immigrants of Newman's generation faced also a particular virulent American homegrown anti-Catholicism. Some of the violent and most violent episodes are found in the historical record. On the left, an image of the burning of the Ursuline nuns convent in Charleston, Massachusetts. Always great suspicion for American Protestants. What's going on with those women who are living together behind those closed doors? And so that frenzy and some tabloid style uh, pamphlets and books were released and it resulted in the convent being burned. In May and July 1844, Philadelphia suffered some of the bloodiest rioting of this period when anti-immigrant mobs attacked Irish American homes and Roman Catholic churches, particularly in the Kensington neighborhood of uh, Philadelphia, and eventually had to be suppressed by the militia. The violence, and this is perhaps very strange for us to think about now, but the violence had something to do with the fact that Catholics were critical that in public schools, the King James Version of the Bible was being taught. And that, that be became something that Catholics wouldn't want to have done, and the public school boards were not willing to listen. So that fight over the Bible was part of the reason that this violence erupts in Philadelphia. In 1842, dozens of Protestant clergymen formed the American Protestant Association to defend America from a great danger, Romanism. And it was in this context that Newman set sail for the United States. There is his passport certificate, um, and on the right, what he looked like when he became Bishop of Philadelphia. But it, it is in this context of anti-Catholicism, of immigrant trauma, of economic insecurity for a lot of Catholics, that Bishop New or that John Newman, later Bishop Newman says, sign me up, that's where I wanna go. His work would be to minister to the immigrants who face threats of economic insecurity and also physical insecurity. He was concerned that these immigrants would lose their faith. And so the church became a responder to all ailments. It became a responder to all ailments kind of church, a doer of all sorts of things, from administering the sacraments to founding hospitals, to opening orphanages, to running social clubs and baseball teams and insurance programs and more. In his short time as Bishop of Philadelphia, Newman built 89 churches. He set up a Catholic parochial school system that is often considered to be the birth of the modern Catholic school system. He actively promoted the establishment of parochial schools and increased the number of schools in his diocese from in 1852, there being two, to nearly 100 just eight years later. He introduced a new worship ritual called the 40 Hours Devotion, which St. Francis just practiced recently. He founded a religious congregation of women called the Third Order of St. Francis of Glen Riddle, which also has a mountain connection. Um, there were members of that congregation at Mount St. Mary's. He worked for a church that was field hospital, but also anchor. 
stabilizing things that would otherwise have uh, gone adrift. So one historian describes this period in American Catholic history using four additional words. I keep giving you more and more words. I hope it's not confusing, but there are many ways to think about church. So uh, maybe some of these will be helpful. So he looked at, the, his name's uh, Jay Dolan from Notre Dame. He wrote one of the first books that studies American Catholic history. It's old now, but it was a turning point kind of book because he studied Catholic laity and what they went through, particularly in different moments of time. And he said, from the 1840s all the way to the 1950s, the American Catholic Church was immigrant church. That was the defining quality of the immigrant, of uh, the Catholic experience, it was immigrant church. And there were four markers of that church, four things about their worldview that shaped uh, Catholic culture. Authority, sin, ritual, and the miraculous. So the immigrant church, the Catholic worldview, was informed by an understanding and a deep uh, feeling about authority, sin, ritual, and the miraculous. And John Newman participated in the church in this way. But I see him, maybe because he wasn't around long enough, and, and then I'll share that he died young. I, I still believe, though, that he saw his work mostly as field hospital. And he wasn't digging in to putting uh, this structure of those four words into all aspects of his life. He was meeting the needs where they are while also trying to provide an anchor, but he didn't have as, as much of a worldview shaped out yet. He knew intimately that the immigrant experience was traumatic, and he saw his work, particularly in building up parochial schools, as one measure, and here's what he did, to preserve language. He didn't want the German immigrant to lose German. He wanted German to be taught in those schools. He wanted them to learn English as well, and he valued his American citizenship, but he wanted to preserve German language and custom and the Catholic faith and family uh, concerns. This is similar, if any of you have ever studied or uncovered, I know Mary Furlong has, Jane Addams in Chicago, who worked with the Settlement House Hall House. That's what she was doing with Italian immigrants as well, because in the traumatic experience of immigration, holding on to culture and custom and language and tradition is very human and very helpful. And this to me seems like what his primary concern was as priest, superior, and bishop. But he also wrote, if you find the lynch, appreciate this, or you probably already know it, he wrote catechetical and teaching guides. He was the author of catechisms to instruct Catholics in his diocese and beyond. I got a few notes. I have a friend who is the archivist of the Redemptorists, his order, in Philadelphia, where actually John Newman uh, is buried. And he sent me some digitized copies. You're not going to be able to see these too well, but these are his notes on St. Francis Xavier's life and work, the Catholic saint, St. Francis Xavier, who, if you read them, these are in French. And if I, I think I got enough of it to see that what he's doing is trying to take the life experience of Francis and how Francis went out and uh, did baptisms and went into the very difficult places to convert people for the Catholic Church and take those core concepts and put them in the catechism. So he was shaped in some ways by the Ignatian tradition and the work of St. Francis Xavier in particular. That's what these notes are. And then these are some of his catechism drafts. He wrote a catechism in English and in German, and he was working on one in Spanish when he died. <clears throat> Ultimately, these catechisms are going to contribute to the Baltimore Catechism that many in this room who came of age in the middle 20th century would know well. So the participation of these books of teaching, uh, that he, uh, he had small catechisms, he had large catechisms, and they contributed to a bigger story in American Catholic history of teaching people uh, the faith. So the St. Francis Xavier Catholic community certainly prayed for the canonization of the bishop who they came to know. At a special mass in June 1977, parishioners brought items to the altar during the offertory uh, related to Newman, including a portrait which was presented by Mrs. Mary Raymer Eberhardt to Monsignor Alphonse Marsenkevich, St. Francis pastor, during a special mass in prayer for the canonization of John Newman. That's the portrait right there. Harry Holt allowed me to remove it from the wall of the sanctuary, or no, of the of vestibule, and I. Uh, I think it's very great that we have this piece that was presented by a parishioner in 1977 because this parish knew well the importance 
of John Newman. I think that I missed a page here because I wanted to share that John Newman actually visited five times. He came to St. Francis five times when he uh, laid the cornerstone, when he inaugurated the church in 1853, and then three more times. And eventually, ultimately, he confirmed 81 uh, youth and adults while here at St. Francis. So it wasn't just the one time. They also brought during this offertory service uh, religious education books, an American flag, and a basket of food for the needy of Adams County. So it's symbolic of the different aspects of John Newman's ministry. And Monsignor Marcin Cabbage was poignant in his homily. He said, it isn't how many things we do. He was remarking on the fact that, uh, that Newman died at 48. He only had seven or eight years as bishop. And so he, why this man a saint? And so he said this, it isn't how many things we do. It is how well we do them. And that is what gives you and me a chance to become a saint. Saints are made and not born. There is the image of the presentation of the uh, portrait that's sitting over there. So bringing it home, this point, point two. After seeing and studying the wounds of the people in his care with his own eyes, St. John Newman relied on his Catholic tradition, but triaged the treatment by establishing centers of care and education first. He was a brick and mortar kind of person, parishes and schools. By creating networks of healers, congregations of Catholic sisters or nuns, like the St. Francis Sisters of Glen Riddle, and practices of learning and worship, like his catechisms and 40-hour devotion. Now, my final point, I have some moments here. This one, we could talk all night, but I only have 10 or more minutes, so I had to be concise with just a few moments after the life, well, before and after the life of John Newman that took place right here at St. Francis. So first, the colonial and frontier history of this region is helpful for us. In the early 18th century, Catholics started arriving to the colony of Pennsylvania, specifically to Philadelphia, of course, but to some other places like Lancaster and Lebanon. And then in the mid 18th century, Jesuits from Maryland came to this area, first to Conewago, and came to minister to the indigenous communities, specifically members of the Huron community who had converted to Catholicism and were fleeing the Iroquois. By 1757, there were about 1,400 Catholics in Adams County, and there were equal parts German and Irish, English speakers, most of the English speakers being Irish. But to our purposes, by 1830, there had been a real need for a Catholic parish in Gettysburg. The people to this point in Gettysburg had been having mass in people's homes, which was not uncommon. And when a priest would come by, they could say mass, and they might not see them for a few weeks. So those priests had to be very specific, the sacraments, and then this is what you should do until I return. And in 1830, though, there was enough interest and there was uh, enough resources to build a Catholic parish, like a uh, building, a uh, church, like I mentioned on South Washington Street. Um, when, one point to add about the construction of the uh, 1852 church, or 1853 church, in raising money for that church, the uh, priest at the time, a Jesuit, James Cunning, who had a real good sense of how to motivate people to give. He had I, sort of funny examples of how he would prey on people's tribalism, or their, this, the Irish not liking Germans, and then still saying, you know, if you don't give, the Germans are gonna give more, they're gonna get to heaven first, and things like that. He did a lot of good stuff about rising Catholics to, through competition. But he also must have been, made some great appeals to Protestants in Gettysburg because he got Schmucker of the Lutheran Seminary to donate to the construction of the 1852 church too. He, he was here for a short time. He uh, built the church and then he left. And in 1858, the Jesuits finally left St. Francis Xavier and it was turned over to the Diocese of Philadelphia. Now, the second, so that moment is about brick and mortar and about fundraising and about sacrifice that goes with fundraising. The second moment relates to the first leaders of the school. Um, this is just the dedication of the church's ad that was in the paper by James Cutting, and that's what the first church looked like. But then as the school became an important part of things, there was a need for even greater fundraising. And some of the people involved in that were the pastor at the time that the school was founded in 1877, Father Ball, and also the second principal. He served as the first principal for a few years, and the second principal was Professor Martin F. Powers. 
Now, Father Bo was the, parent, the pastor who opened this small parochial school. He was born in Ireland, in Waterford, Ireland, to be exact. Um, he started out at, at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore. This is the guy on the left, but decided that he was called to be a teacher. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, that's Powis. I, something happened to my notes here, and I apologize. Um, Ball was here just for, uh, served as principal just for a few years and got things started. It was Powers who had this interest in being a priest and ultimately decides he preferred to be a teacher. He taught in schools in New Orleans uh, before coming to Gettysburg. He arrived in 1879 and he was principal for 18 years. <clears throat> I, I really appreciated what was said about him in his obituary, so I wanted to read that. This is Professor Powers. His death will be sincerely mourned by all who knew him, by all who felt the impression of his strong personality and forcible character, and especially by all who were fortunate enough to be his pupils. Conscientious, honorable, pious, energetic, stern in his sense of duty, with unswerving faith in what was good and true, he has given us an example of a true gentleman. In him were exemplified at all times the virtues of a Christian life, and to know him was to feel that the lofty ideals which he aimed, armed at, and upheld to others found in his daily life their best beauty and, rec and recommendation. So in learning a little more about him, he as was survived by his wife and six children. It seems to me he was a person well regarded across uh, the St. Francis community as well as the community of Gettysburg. To see him act outside of this environment was to see him act like he was inside. He was a great example and a great model for uh, the parish and the school. So I think this moment was about how the slow growth of parochial education at St. Francis was championed by some really good people who also knew how to lead and knew how to connect people beyond the parish, within the parish, but also beyond it. They worked on curriculum, they found out what the best curriculum at the public schools were, they wanted to match that, and then add on to it catechism, but also the arts. And it's striking to me, given how important the arts are still today, that the history goes back to the very beginning of a real commitment to music and theater and visual art that these two individuals also championed. I have some images. You've probably seen this one. This is from the Adams County Historical Society. They colorized this image of the 1910-1911 graduating class of St. Francis. You can see how small it is. So it was a slow start. You know, John Newman was building schools all through Philadelphia in the 1850s, and, we, and they were big schools. Here's some pictures of schools from Philadelphia. You can see the size. Um, this is the graduating class of St. Peter's in Philadelphia. And ours was still small, which is understandable but it, it, it just shows the uh, differences between rural Catholicism and urban Catholicism. The third moment has to do with the Sisters of Mercy. And I have to admit, this might be my favorite thing that I looked into, because for a short time, the school was put under the charge of the Sisters of Charity from 1899 to 1904. But I think the largest impact came when the Sisters of Mercy arrived in 1904, and they stayed until 2010 with women religious such as Sister Mary Angelica, Sister Maurice, Sister Mary Incarna, uh, in, in, in in and Sister Phyllis Simmons, uh, serving as principal. The Sisters of Mercy, you maybe know, were founded by Mother Catherine McCauley in Ireland in 1831, and the Dallas Regional Community of Mercy Sisters, of which all of these women were a part, uh, had its connection to 1848 with the founding of the Loretto Community of Sisters from Pittsburgh. There's a lot of moving parts here about how congregations merged and then pulled apart, but uh, just know that Dallas, as I'm sure many of you already know, Pennsylvania is the center of this religious community today. In 1924, um, this community built a mother house in Dallas and opened the College of Misericordia. The Sisters of Mercy, the Mercy Sisters to me, are all about moments of love and innovation, as I understood it in the history of St. Francis. One innovation <clears throat> had to be finding teachers beyond their own religious community. By the time uh, the Catholic Church crosses over the year 1965, 1966, definitely 1968, immigrant church is no longer. There's not that uh, um, confidence that new priests will be replaced or new sisters, teachers will be replaced, as you know. So it's a new reality. And what is a Catholic school with a lot of Catholic families who still want to use it going to do if they can't find Catholic teachers? So one thing that they did 
if you look on the, I'll go back to that slide in a minute. You're not, you can't see it, but on the left there, um, that's from the late 1960s, it says, problem solved. When St. Francis Xavier School found need for lay teachers, it turned to Gettysburg Lutheran Theological Seminary for help. Uh, through seminary, school was able to obtain 16 seminary students for tutoring program and four qualified non-Catholic lay teachers to teach part-time. Sister Incarnata, school principal, discussed this program with Dr. Lee Jordel of Lutheran Seminary and Father Al uh, Alphonse Barsenkavich, pastor of parish. That was in a Connecticut Catholic paper. So it was such an innovation that this thing that they did in Gettysburg, because of a real need to have good teachers, uh, made it to this Connecticut Catholic paper. I would equate other items um, that I've uncovered from more recent publications, the Cash for Computers Variety Option, the Karam Academic Scholarships. These are innovations that uh, I think the Sister Phyllis and the Sisters of Mercy were able to energize amongst the school community. I just included this to show the change over time. Again, this isn't a tr my normal traditional style of history lecturing. In that, I would try to trace, trace more accurately how things change over time. And you can tell in the looks of these images change over time in the way the Sisters of Mercy adapted themselves and responded to the times uh, as while here at St. Francis School. Special lay teachers and administrators also were empowered by the Sisters of Mercy, people like Margaret Matson, Noreen Knights, Annie Yinks. And then of course, getting back to Sister Phyllis. Now, I never thought I'd be quoting from my old foe, then turned friend, Fred Snyder. In this lecture tonight, Fred Snyder writes for the Gettysburg Times and passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago. And we did have a complicated relationship, but we ended it pretty well. But his uh, article that included uh, a Reflection on Sister Phyllis, I think, is really touching. So this is for Fred, <laughs> Sister Phyllis. She smiled when I asked her about her biggest accomplishments in her 38 years at St. Francis. She told me opening the kindergarten in 1973 was her biggest, with an enrollment of just 25 children, followed by preschool half-day sessions in 1999, and the opening of the Dr. Irving A. Karam Computer Lab in 1994. Now, Fred doesn't get everything right all the time, so if that's not right, um, I'm sorry, but um, Sister Phyllis also says there are many people reasonable, responsible for, quote, making me look good. She mentioned her good friend in heaven, Noreen Knights, Annie Yanks, her administrative assistant, and the many parents and faculty. She also mentioned how proud she is of the first lay principal of St. Francis, Becky Sid, who took her place and the many pastors under whom she worked. So I'm just really moved by the long and committed legacy of the Sisters of Mercy at this place both in, in changing themselves, but staying close to the mission, and by reaching out to empower additional people, even people that could never be perhaps thought of as teaching in the school, like seminary students from the Lutheran tradition, uh, but being so confident in the foundation of what they are and who they do and their Catholic teaching that they were able to adapt in those ways. And I have a dream, Sherry Grenchik's not here, the uh, eighth grade teacher, but if you see her, tell her I'm gonna be emailing her about this. Wouldn't it be great if we could take 7th and 8th grade students from St. Francis to the Mercy Heritage Center in Belmont, North Carolina, not far from Charlotte, to visit the archives of the Dallas Regional Community Collection. All the materials from our specific Sisters of Mercy are there in Belmont. 193 linear feet, including documents, bound volumes, photographs, sound recordings, VHS tapes. I love archives, so it would be great to share those with our students and see if they can contribute something about it, and then produce local history projects uh, if, if planned the right way. So love and innovation. And then finally, and I'm gonna be brief on this one, uh, uh, Becky said. So uh, Becky has served this community as a parent, a teacher, and for the last 12 years as a principal. And I found that one thing you realize when you walk into this building is that everyone admires and respects Mrs. Say, particularly the teachers and particularly the students. Um, she really uh, has found a way to embody the traditions of this place, and there are so many, and, and they're so good, but also be willing to hear new ideas. And for our family, you know, we came here 10 years ago, and we didn't know anyone, and to like drop your kid off at the school and then walk away, that's kind of a hard thing. So for Becky, it was, um, for us, it was a very personal connection that Becky made with our school, and then we had more children, and it uh, kept being repeated. But I'm gonna not uh, share too much here because this future is unwritten. Becky has been uh, principal since 2010, 
Um, and there have been challenges in the last year, but there have also been great triumphs and successes. And so if those continue to be built upon, if the foundation can be remembered while planning new pathways, I think this future that is unwritten uh, is going to be so positive, and as all these other moments have been. Um, the leadership of Mississippi is both firmly planted in the story of this place, but also poised to move us in new directions. So bringing this last point home about moments, historical study, now this is self-interested, but so I'm a historian, but historical study allows us to see moments of action from the past, which if carefully analyzed, can animate our present, like an artist fills a canvas, while also pointing us to new directions. This evening, I've tried to share something of the theology and history of this place right here. It's the institutional saga that has stretched centuries, which is powerful in and of itself, but as I mentioned, is more left unwritten, is work left undone. But in closing, when I revisited the concept of metaphor, Francis' field hospital, model of John Newman and his response to the immigrant church, and these four very light looks at moments in time, I realize that there's something else going on here that is crucial to understanding Pope Francis. Pope Francis has been building on a way of thinking and a way of reflecting on God and the world that's called See, Judge, Act. And that has a history uh, that dates to the middle 20th century in France. It was a kind of way that inspired a lot of individuals that lived in Latin America. Uh, in the 1960s, and we're seeing the economic and political strife around them and trying to figure out what Catholicism could do for them or, or how they could live their Catholicism in such violent places. And what they put together was this practice where you begin, begin by seeing the issue and facing it head on. That's the concept of Francis saying, go see the wounds. You have to be in front of the wounds. You have to use sociology and history and other forms of knowledge in order to get at that. Then you judge this, but you judge it through tradition. Newman did not just invent ways of responding to those German immigrants. He had the tradition. He had those, those notes from St. Francis Xavier. He had the commitment to a catechetical uh, philosophy of teaching. He had networks of religious communities. So he relied on that to organize the response to those wounds. And then finally, you have to act. There are moments in time where we can see that people acted. If uh, Martin Powers didn't say, I'm gonna make the best Catholic school here in Gettysburg, and he stayed at it for 18 years, perhaps the school would have folded. If the Sisters of Mercy didn't recognize that their numbers were declining, what are we gonna do? Perhaps that we would have a different story. If Mrs. Sig and the teachers said, it's too hard, COVID has become too challenging, and uh, let's go work somewhere else. Uh, we, we would not have our children still having this benefit. So I didn't plan originally to have this talk end with see, judge, act, this old way of, or relatively old, the 50 year way of Catholics trying to be Catholic in these moments of time, but it ended up uh, being there for me at the end. There are some other words that begin with the letter M. You know, I went with alliteration at the beginning, so I decided I'd just like stick with it to the end, that may be also helpful. Maintenance, uh, morale, money, ministers, magnanimity of those ministers. We, have, we are about to welcome a new minister to St. Francis. Movement, this school has moved several times, as has the church, and sometimes that's so important. You need movement to stay alive. A little personal anecdote, my family is having the opportunity to move to Prague, coincidence, for the fall semester to do Mount St. Mary's study abroad from August to November. So I aspire to learn even more about John Newman when I'm there. But movements can be healthy and helpful as we've seen in our own history. Music. Um, a friend once told me that no one comes away from church services humming the homily. Sorry about that. Um, and I think that applies to this lecture too. You know, you're not gonna be remembering too much of what I've said today, only remember some of the words. So we need the arts and we're blessed in Gettysburg and we're blessed in St. Francis. We have a robust music culture. Uh, let's keep that going. We have media. For a long time, we had the superstar of Gettysburg Media right here. And we know that he remains committed to using media and also remains so committed to St. Francis Church. 
And then finally, if we need mission, you know, simple questions with hard answers. Why are we here? What are we called to be? So thank you for listening. I hope that I've shared a couple things that will be helpful to you. Thank you, Charles, and we're prepared to engage in some conversation. Everybody has any comments or questions, and we'll give you the mic so that you can be heard. Here's a small It's just an observation. I'm a companion of Sisters of uh, uh, St. Francis and are now of Philadelphia, so I was very glad to see that you included that. They started the university in 1965. It's now called the University. And they, I had the chance to travel at the Lawn for two years to be an adjunct uh, uh, instructor there. And just today, I see something that their class would all be 40% first generation. And I was thinking about that when we were talking about that as well. So right. I just want to make that up. No, uh, thank you. There's a really interesting history of schools, also Trinity. Uh, Catholic University of Washington, D.C. has recently, rent, uh, well, in the last 10 years, has turned from a school for the wealthy, uh, the children of wealthy Catholic families in the D.C. area, Nancy Pelosi went to school there, for example, to a school that is, is accepting students from that part of D.C. So changing one's mission to respond to the times, I think is what Mary's saying. That's a really interesting thing to see in Catholic places. You might be wrong, but I think that she's a financial officer at Trinity for a while. She was a member of our parish. She was, yeah. Mike Howard. I have a question about why Sisters of Mercy is it in near Charlotte, you said. The museum of whatever is there. Yeah. Why is it there? Right. I think, well, Belmont Abbey College is there. I don't know if they had a good deal on land. I'm not sure. Sometimes Catholic places have property, but there's a great archivist right behind you who can maybe has a better answer. But she, she has the answer probably. The Sisters of Mercy are a huge group, and they many of them were diocesan, and in the 20th century, they united to become the Sisters of Mercy of America, etc. So they centralized and they've centralized all their archives into that property in Belmont, which was available because individually the small the, the communities could no longer maintain them professionally. Thank you. I knew you would know the answer. Okay. Um, we've seen the paints and stuff over the price of I'm concerned about the future because, you know, in these days, what we've seen on here, there was really a total separation of state and religion more so than what was being now. When these court cases all come down and they're not up to Catholic teaching, and in a lot of these schools, and I think St. Francis that were not state and also they get federal funding, how will this affect the future of Catholic schools? Um, that's a good question. I'll start with that. I think it would, it, it's going to be, I would imagine it's situational. So court cases do uh, change cultures. They uh, can disrupt things. They can also affirm and heal other things. But situationally, how leaders and dioceses and principals of schools would determine what to do is what I would be waiting to see. So th there's very little that we would be able to predict in my mind about how things would happen until we see what it is that is being you know, decided and then how situationally in different states, different uh, religious communities respond to how they still live out what they do in their schools. It has affected, I understand, I, know, I think I know what you're getting at, because it has affected Catholic adoptions in, in Catholic hospitals and it's not just schools where these things get to be complicated. Um, I, I guess I just remain in, in more hope about this than despair. And that's yeah. a lot of concern, too. It's not a unified church of what it was in these days. It's well, I mean, it, 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 I think the synod process is trying to suggest that, like, the more local we can make something, perhaps the better. Like, we, we, we may know much more about, you know, northeastern Pennsylvania and the dynamics of this than they do in Rome. 
And so uh, having conversations about individual or local response might be one uh, approach. I, this, this gets a little more out of my area related to legal theory and, and theology, but I, I would share that I would wait and see what the decisions are and then how local communities choose to respond. I want to thank you very much for your talk. I certainly enjoyed it. I'd like to just make a comment, though, and then ask the question. Um, my comment would be on the very interesting silent film. Those white words that you saw on the back of people coming out, those were daughters of charity oh, right. in Emmitsburg with their large white yes. cornets. Yes, flying thank nuts. you. I'm so sorry. Yes. And they were the ones that were at the uh, church during the Civil War. And the, having read their journals, the vestibule was the operating room. They took bench the pews apart so that they could be uh, stretchers, and then the sanctuary was the recovery room. That's a great point. I, I was thinking about that because there are two sets of nuns there, or sisters there. Mm -hmm. I wondered if the ones without those habits were the Sisters of Mercy, just with the daughters. Probably. Probably. And then right next to them were, yeah, the, mm -hmm. sisters, the Daughters of Charity habits. So thank My you. My question you. is, Traditionally, there's been a belief that it's been promoted that Elizabeth Seton was the founder of the American Catholic school system, which I tend to disagree with. After examining some of the history of John Moyman, would you say, based on his, ex that he really organized the first Catholic parochial school system yes. in Philadelphia, therefore would be the founder of the American Catholic school system? Well, I don't want to I don't want to fight anybody about it, but it's <laughs> not a to see. I would say that um, the parochial school system under the charge of the diocese is absolutely, to me, clear that John Newman did that, and uh, what. Elizabeth Seaton was doing, she was sending sisters out from Emmitsburg to found schools, but not exactly in that organizational structure. I just noticed Tom Jolin stopped in, and one thing I've learned in my research, Tom, weren't you an uh, artist in residence here for a year? Yeah, a couple years. Yeah, yeah that was a really cool thing. So I, knew, I knew Tom, and I'm a member of St. Francis, but didn't put it together until I researched for this. We made some comments about the arts here, and uh, living them out. Thanks, Charles, for your talk. It was great. My memory, or at least my impression, was that when the Pope offered the measure for a field hospital, it was meant to kind of surprise people or kind of get them to reconsider the role of the church in the world. So can you just say more about St. John Newman and sort of how, whether he, whether he was of his time or how what he was doing at the time was perhaps itself different or gave people different ways of thinking about how the church, church could be? That's such a good question, and part of it is about how he wasn't around in leadership for that long. So there's not a, a whole history to grab. But there is clearly differences between him and other bishops. First, he didn't seek the role. He didn't want to be head of the superior, he didn't want to be superior of the Redemptorist, he didn't want to be Bishop of Philadelphia, and he wasn't a political pope in the way that other late 19th century popes sometimes uh, function. And, and I don't mean political in a negative way, I mean it actually in a positive way. Uh, so his commitment as a missionary first, a, a Bohemian, to come to a place to respond to people that talked like him and came from the part of the world he did, I think was so central to him. Now there were, of course, bishops from Ireland, um, but I think there were the Central European dynamic that there weren't uh, lots of openings for non-English speaking bishops gave him a kind of outsider perspective that is crucial to understanding field hospitals. Because um, field hospitals, I think, are uncomfortable. Well, I'm not, fortunately, I'm not, well, maybe unfortunately, I'm not been into a field hospital, but they can't be comfortable places. And uh, when you're faced with discomfort of the trauma of immigration and the confusion of a new job that you kind of don't know so well, I believe, in the reading I did in the book that I would share, there aren't many books written, not any academic biographies of John Newman written. The one that I read, is this um, Bishop John Newman, fourth bishop of Philadelphia by Michael Curley, and it's quite old, but it was uh, archival based. There are more recent ones that are reflections, more um, sort of light touches on him. I encourage visits to the Redemptorist archive and the shrine 
in Philadelphia. Has anyone been there? Do you have any comment about it? It's very nice. Yeah. You should go see it. <laughs> it's very nice. And my friend Patrick Hayes is the archivist there, so tell him you're from St. Francis and, and he'll show you a good tour. But I wish I had more for you. Um, I would use the outsider status, the Central European conviction, the languages, um, and then the, the deep recognition about what immigration is like. Do you want to add to that? Well, just from the from the archive, you learn a lot about his personal holiness. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. Uh, going through that archive in, in Philadelphia, in St. John Newman Shrine, uh, you learn a lot about his personal holiness. Uh, they have uh, portions of his personal journals, um, things that he didn't tell him, that people didn't know about him until after he died. Uh, he was a man of intense penances. Uh, the penances that he would operate, he wasn't giving up meat on Friday, he would, he would wear a, a, an iron chain around his leg so that he was constantly in a small amount of pain everywhere he went, uh, which gave him an incredible capacity to empathize with uh, the people that he served. He's a man of very deep holiness, which I means he's a saint, obviously we would hope that, uh, but in ways that were not typical amongst bishops, uh, that he would, right. he lived That's out the Irish Irish. Yes. And the, uh, I scoured as much as I could to see, is there anything in his life that would be like, I should deal with because it's a negative. There, there's a, a lot of 19th century bishops got into many arguments with religious communities of women, bossing them around, uh, telling them, I need you to come here. Go. He has only one like half story related to that, and it doesn't sound that, um, that difficult. So it, he got along with them a lot, so I'm suggesting here, I think, and he knew that leadership meant that it wasn't about power, uh, which, if you look at other 19th century bishops, it's not the case. Would you mind elaborating on the circumstances of how uh, John Newman was canonized, miracles attributed to him? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, that I did read, but I'm going to have to remind myself. I know the exact place to go to for it. Um, I d does anybody have that um, closer in their minds than I do right now? Um, I was just at this website when I was looking to let's see where that is. Yes. So this lists the actual names of the individuals, if I remember. Um, yes. Okay. So, um, so in 1957, uh, some American bishops write to the Pope, and they tried to get around the qualification for how many miracles would be necessary. I recall that. And then the actual individual. In 1959, over 150 sermons were preached on his life. 6,000 people visited his tomb. So that was why they opened, that's why they wrote the letter. Can we start this cause so people can start praying and visiting? And then two miracles um, would be for that of Lenahan. And so who was Lenahan? I'm sorry, I didn't have this right in my mind. Where is Lenahan? Okay. Ken Lenahan, Jr. of Villanova, Pennsylvania, was critically injured in a car crash in 1949. However, there was long-standing debate if his unexpected full recovery was due to Newman's intervention or Lenahan's quote, youthful constitution. So that was number one, to try to deal with that one. And then in addition to him, uh, was an 11-year-old in Italy named Eva Benassi, and um, doesn't really say too much. I think I might have to follow back up with you. As you can tell, I did not examine this part of it too much, other than to see the dates and how many people were praying. And this parish certainly prayed a lot um, in visits to Philadelphia. So I'm sorry I don't have that better. Is that what you were asking? Thank you, Dr. Schnauss. That was a really great reaction. As somebody who was at St. Francis School in the 60s, it was nice seeing Sister Carnot and Monsignor Marcy Gavitt. They were, they were great people. I have a, a question. It's kind of a more a, a lighter kind of thing than what some of the stuff we've been talking about. But in your research, have you run across anything related to the proper pronunciation of St. John Newman's last name? And the yes. only reason I mention this is if you ever listen to Sirius XM Radio's Catholic Channel, which is a ministry of the Archdiocese in New York, all the radio personalities there, whether they be lay people or priests, including Cardinal Dolan, are always hammering the point that we mispronounce his name. Yeah. It should be Neumann. Right. 
Well, if we're a German speaker or we're in Bohemia or the Czech Republic, it would be more like Neumann, but my uh, mouth doesn't move that well to do it precisely right. I am married to a German language person, but she's on vacation. She's not around. Anyway, <laughs> she's on a trip with her friends. Um, so I did email the archivist, the one I keep mentioning, Pat Hayes. To anglicize his name is what we've done. When we say Newman, we've anglicized it. Like we anglicize a lot of other words. And I'm comfortable with that, but also recognizing what we've done. We've anglicized a German uh, sounding name. It also gets confusing because there's the other Newman, it's John Henry Newman, who more people know about. So I've actually, I've told people I'm gonna be talking about John Newman, like he, he was in your parish, but that's a different one. So technically, yes, Dolan is perfectly correct. Uh, and I've just anglicized it. Does that help? Yeah, and, and he, uh, he always hammers people yeah. whenever Well, at the shrine, uh, Pat Hayes told me at the shrine they call him Newman, and he, he wrote to me that in an email. It's said N E W M A N, that's how to pronounce it. So that's what I do. Hi, you mentioned that he died at a young age. Um, how did he die? A uh, heart attack. And it was unexpected. I read a lot about his exhaustion. He was a, like a workaholic. Um, and he took these spiritual practices very uh, seriously, and he didn't get a lot of sleep. So perhaps that was connected to it, um, but he just dropped dead, um, I think almost instantaneously, right? Yeah, at 48. It was unexpected. There is a very interesting book about the canonization process for America. Um, men and women, which does discuss the women um, the cause as well as the Seton, and there was great competition between the cardinals involved. Who was going to be first, believe me, and it comes out in the book by Kathleen Sproul Cummings, um, a saint of our time or a saint for our nation. A saint of our own. saint of our own. That's it. It's very well done, very interesting. Yeah, it's about, I mean, is it five? It's five or six stories of saints that America uh, was interested in having canonized. Like, I think I mentioned in America was mission territory until well into the 20th century. And so to, as America gets out of that, the next thing is, well, now we need our saints here. We want to have devotions of American saints. And Kathy's book gets into that really. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, let me just a uh, couple things. Uh, this is going to end up on the web page. Okay, so this was recorded tonight. It'll be on the St. Francis web page. We certainly want to thank the college family for their contribution. This lecture is always one of the highlights of the year here at St. Francis. And I think we should mention that Becky Sinkin is here in the audience, and we should acknowledge her contribution. And thank you all very much for coming. Good evening. Good job.